um, welcome everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Lashley. I'm the founder and the director of Learning Life, which is now the kind of um, the organization that sponsors um, these meetings, uh, Citizen Diplomacy International. Uh, I am going to share my screen and go over the agenda uh, for today's meeting, if I can do so. Hold on a second. For some reason, the speaker view. My. Okay. Okay. There is my pen. There's the what I was looking for. All right. Uh, so um, this is, uh, if you can see this, I'm just going to give you a sense of um, the the agenda. Uh, for today. So um, you should introduce yourselves if you've just arrived in the Zoom chat. Please also indicate what country, what city and country you're coming from. Uh, it's good for us to know these things. Um, and um, the we are then going to just jump into the presentations. Uh, each of our presenters will have um, 15 minutes to present, and then we're going to follow that with discussion of about 35 minutes, um, 35 to 40 minutes, and then uh, we'll finish with announcements. Um, so if you have announcements of citizen diplomacy related uh, information, by all means, um, let us know. Um, the uh, Our new co-editor for the CDI bulletin, um, Brian Smith, who just raised his hand, uh, is uh, going to be presenting that new CDI bulletin. You'll see that it, for those of you who've been here with us before, you'll see that it looks different um, and is a new look. Um, and uh, meeting participants have the opportunity to kind of just, as I mentioned, announce um, any uh, citizen diplomacy related events, publications, projects, programs, or related needs. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Vijay um, Chatu. Uh, I may be mispronouncing that, Vijay, so um, uh, uh, apologies if I'm uh, doing so. Um, but let me give a brief introduction to, um, to Vijay. Hold on a second. Okay. I just need to bring up the right information. Okay. So um, Vijay Kumar Chatu is a global health physician specializing in global health governance, diplomacy, and security. Uh, Dr. Chatu has did his uh, bachelor's of medicine, bachelor of surgery, and his MD in India, his master's of public health and in um, health policy and management in Belgium, his master's in global health uh, governance in South Africa, and his PhD thesis in international relations focuses on global health diplomacy. He's also completed specialization in global health diplomacy from the Geneva Graduate Institute and Nova University of Lisbon, and an executive diploma in international law from the UN Institute for Training and Research. As a Fogarty International Fellow, he started his career working in various areas of global health, such as maternal, uh, newborn child health, sexually transmitted infections, tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, Zika, Ebola, COVID-19, and on global policies for prevention of non-communicable diseases. Uh, Dr. Chatu is one of the top researchers in sustainability at the University of Toronto and is the recipient of the Adam Sustainability Action Award 2023. He has over 350 research publications and was ranked among the world's top two scientists in public health by Stanford University rankings in 2021 and 22. On global health diplomacy, Dr. Chatu has contributed over 50 um, papers linking health and foreign policy. As a global health policy advisor, he contributes to the T20 policy briefs as part of the G20 summits and consults with multilateral organizations such as the World Bank, the World Health Organization, and the UN Program on HIV AIDS. He serves as co-lead for the Governance Steering Committee as Climate Migration and Health Network uh, at Ghent University. 
and the UN University Institute on Comparative Regional Integration Studies. Um, he's currently based at Timurti, um, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto, and is an adjunct professor at the University of Alberta. Uh, I'm also going to introduce um, Sali as well, um, so I'll let you know about her, and I'll do that now, and then uh, have them present one after the other. Uh, Sali Hafez um, is a researcher and global health specialist who has worked extensively on health systems in fragile states and low and middle income countries, focusing on the intersection of health, gender, sexual violence, and child protection. For the last 15 years, she led multi-country humanitarian response and research in over 15 countries, including Liberia, Lebanon, Libya, Uganda, Kenya, Egypt, Iraq, Djibouti, Bangladesh, Sudan, Yemen, South Sudan, and Jordan, with UN agencies and INGOs like the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. She works to strengthen health systems, governance, and workforces in low- and middle-income countries and post-conflict states. She has led multiple health policy and agenda-setting processes and contributed to multiple health networks, including the Arab Coalition for Population and Development, the post-2015 uh, Global Advocacy Group, Decolonization, Decolonization of Global Health um, Working Group, and Women in Global Health Leadership. Her field experience is complemented by technical knowledge, academic study, and professional learning. She obtained her Master's of Health Science um, in global health at the University of Tampere in, fin in Finland in 2017 and her Bachelor of Dental Surgery degree from Alexandria University in Egypt in 2009. She's a doctoral candidate in public health at the London School of Hygiene for Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and visiting fellow at Haller Medical University in Iraq. So with that said, um, Vijay, you are first and feel free to share your screen. I've got three people to add to the conversation. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for the great introduction. And uh, uh, especially I thank all my, I mean, my collaborators from India who joined at this late night. And, you know, thank you very much. Uh, so without wasting my time, uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So... Thank you very much again, Debbie and Paul, for coordinating this. I think, you know, we had, uh, I mean, it is very strange that, you know, we had this discussion a few weeks ago through a paper. I think um, you got to read that paper and you got back and, you know, we had a discussion and I didn't think it will turn up to be a seminar like this today. And uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, so the topic of today's presentation is... Um, it's basically, you know, the work I did for my doctoral research, uh, strengthening global health security through global health diplomacy. So the slides are a bit darker, but, you know, as we delve deeper, you know, I'll make it more brighter, okay? So uh, <laughs> uh, my, uh, the, basically I will cover these things. Uh, I will discuss about the objectives, the introduction, the theory framework, theoretical framework I used. Uh, and also uh, some results because, you know, uh, since I'm sharing from my research, uh, it's going to be very big, but, you know, for the time constraints and the little time I have. So, you know, I think in 15 minutes, I should be able to wrap it up. Uh, before I go to the topic, I just want to give you an idea of my journey, but I think, you know, Paul has already summarized uh, in that way. So, Basically, um, I, I started my journey in India after my medicine, then later I did my MPH and I tried to special, the reason why I'm showing this is because, you know, I try to uh, learn, uh, you know, get into other disciplines other than community medicines, because as you delve deeper, you know, you realize, you know, most of the problems, most of the health issues are not just linked with medical department or health department. You deal with, you know, socioeconomic, geopolitical, these issues as well. And for example, even for NCDs and all that, you know, when doing research in cancer, you realize that they don't just happen. They happen because of the lifestyle. They happen because of exposures and also, again, you know, it has a very wider linkages with the globalized world. So basically after that, then I realized, okay, you know, it is not just health. Now, if you want to make a policy change, you need to have some 
policy experience as well. You need to have that multidisciplinary research experience to connect the dots. So after my education and, you know, the journey, then still, I mean, you know, in my work experience, again, you know, I had a mix of both program experience, academic and research. That too, again, with, you know, working with the government agencies, universities, ministries of uh, health, as well as, you know, INGOs and uh, multilaterals like the World Bank and uh, WHO. Again, you know, the kind of work you get involved is when you uh, get into that, you realize that actually things are not just isolated. You need to connect the dots. So I think, you know, the topic for me, there's a reason why I chose this topic. And um, before I go into that, you know, I just want to give an idea like what I'm going to talk about. It's not like more uh, educating or, you know, giving a lecture on this, but, you know, it's more of understanding, understanding the concept and also realizing its importance, how we actually encounter this in our daily lives. So I will discuss briefly about the concepts of uh, global health diplomacy, as well as global health security. And we will also see what are the different kinds of uh, public health risks that endangers the global health in general. And we will see what are the frameworks actually at global level that are there and how we ensure them and how basically through this global health diplomacy, how we are going to address or strengthen the health security. So this slide is, you know, more like a theoretical, but, you know, you need not worry about it. It's basically, you know, there are different, there are many like, you know, around seven to eight definitions of health diplomacy, global health diplomacy, medical diplomacy. But the thing is, the crux of this is basically it is interdisciplinary. It is not just a medical doctor or a public health speaking, but it's more of people from other departments other than health. For example, like political sciences, international law, economics, foreign policy, anthropology, you know, uh, you have technology nowadays. So, you know, it's a mix of all these disciplines and that's what make it very special. And... Uh, there is another one uh, which is called as, I mean, another term also called as health diplomacy. Uh, again, you know, it is given by the health diplomats before. I mean, it's based in Geneva and they, they also talk about the same. Uh, they define it in a way that, you know, there are multiple stakeholders involved in this. People are involved from politics, people are involved from public health, but their aim is ultimately to improve the health systems and the health indicators and all that. So uh, the recently and the most widely accepted definition is from Kate Bush et al. from Switzerland. Uh, I mean, I was uh, she was my teacher before in 2014, and uh, I, I studied from there, as Paul mentioned before. So the widely accepted one is like, you know, multi-level, multi-actor negotiation process that shape and manage a global policy environment for health. So it, it is kind of comprehensive, which tries to include. So, you know, uh, if you apply that definitions and if you see if this global health diplomacy is well conducted, basically, then, you know, you can reap many benefits. I mean, you know, it results in different kinds of outputs and they're not just in health. So, you know, if you look at the sustainable development goals, I mean, some of you may have an idea already. Some of you are already working in that. So I highlighted here that it improves global health definitely. That is linked to goal number three. Uh, it improves the uh, it improves the equity issues. So again, you know, it talks about uh, goal number ten. So you have again, it improves the better relations and uh, commitment for proper development to work at uh, national level, international level, having public private partnerships. So you know, all these things are part of uh, the uh, outcomes of global health diplomacy. Uh, this is one of the slides. I mean, you know, which I use this picture for my previous papers. There, I tried to connect the domains of peace, development, and health. Not so many appreciate that, you know, because the WHO has a program called as, you know, health as a bridge uh, for peace. So, you know, basically health can be used as a, a you know, soft power, uh, you know, to uh, promote peace and well-being. I think, you know, Sally will be sharing more of this uh, from her humanitarian work. So basically, what I'm trying to say is even though it is global health, but then it has wider ramifications in the sense it impacts, you know, a lot of other domains as well. So where does this happen? Uh, everyone thinks, you know, diplomacy is something that happens at the UN or with, between the ambassadors or between two countries or bilateral agreements. But I think, you know, we have seen that, you know, diplomacy is happening, happening everywhere. It is happening at individual level, informal level. It is happening at 
uh, regional meets like your know, European Union, African Union. It is happening at the big formats like for such as the G7, G20, the UN and all. So, you know, in this picture, you can see the different kind of uh, activities that are happening. But at the same time, you have to you'll appreciate that the core diplomacy at the center happens between uh, either at the United Nations or between the bilateral partners, what they're going to do. Now I'll switch to global health security. Uh, again, it's a uh, multidisciplinary con uh, component. So according to Global Health Council, they, they say that, you know, global health security basically means having strong public health. I mean, as the name suggests, basically they want to prevent all kinds of threats, all kinds of uh, diseases, either communicable or non-communicable, or even created by, you know, biological weapons, which can be used, uh, you know, uh, for example, even, you know, issues like, I mean, the recent pandemic, COVID-19 and the monkeypox and all these things are coming. So basically, you need to have systems in such a such a way that you know you can be able to prevent them, uh, and also have you know uh, strategies to uh, you know address uh, before it becomes a major pandemic. So what we found that you know during this COVID pandemic is that even though the countries may be very well developed, such as UK, US, or you know many European countries, they are ranked number one, number two, number three in global health security index. But when it came to mortality and morbidity, I think, you know, they suffered a lot, meaning that we are not prepared. You know, we have systems, we have the ranking, we have indicators, but the thing is, in actual practice, probably the health systems were not robust enough. So like that, you know, we have different frameworks, like, you know, as my objective says, what are the different frameworks for this global health security? For example, the WHO's uh, International Health Regulations is IHR 2005. This is what we say because uh, it was modified in 2005 and we amended that. So basically, as part of that, all countries have committed that, you know, they are going to report the cases, take appropriate measures if something, uh, some epidemic happens. So basically, it's not just um, uh, communicable diseases, but also from recently, uh, uh, the researchers as well as the diplomats and also the leaders have framed the non-communicable diseases also as one of the global health threats. So basically now we can understand that, you know, even infectious diseases and also NCDs, the chronic diseases are also uh, posing global health threat. So from my work for the past few years, I developed this framework basically uh, so you can apply this generally. For example, in the uh, the red color, you can see pandemics or you know any epidemic or any war, conflict, climate change, the current situation that we are facing. So anything can result in any of the following four or even more, uh, which are in blue here, like the destruction of infrastructure, health facilities, wash. Uh, then you know it improves the mortality, morbidity. I think the displacement and refugee migration issues, Sally will be talking more on that. Uh, then, you know, it also has a wider economic crisis, even for example, the recent earthquake, let's say, you know, I mean, uh, in Turkey or other places, you know, they are going to have this impact, you know, people are displaced, they have to move to other places or, you know, they have to find a place of job or, you know, to survive and all that. So when these things these happen as a crisis, immediately it will impact on the health so the health systems get overburdened. So basically, uh, you see the arrow goes here, and you know, and you can see there is a rise in communicable diseases, and you know, rise in malnutrition. So all these kinds of health-related issues directly will happen. And also, you know, when the, you have the economic crisis and failure of food supply chains and all that, again, you are not sustainable on your own. You are externally dependent, either for food, either for money, either for funding, or for infrastructure and all that. So now in this case, you know, global health diplomacy comes as a liaison or as a mediator or it is the, uh, you know, uh, it comes into play for negotiations and through the application of various international norms or agreements, what we have at global level, it will result in improving the access, improving care, you know, or developing the infrastructure and all that. So, you know, this is just a, a general framework, how it works, but, you know, you can always customize that according to one particular situation. So currently in this globalized world, as we see that, you know, I mean, even the problems are also so much interconnected, you know, it's not just one country having, having a problem, it's just settled with that. I think, you know, it has implications, implications on other countries as well. And I think, you know, even health is also very much dependent on other sectors. 
And besides, we frame that the UN has said that health is a human right. And, you know, when you say again, human right, again, you know, there are different uh, insecurities that are brought to human, uh, human health or human security. For example, the UNDP has framed, you know, seven dimensions of human security. For example, uh, you know, the health security, food security, community security, political security. So there are seven kinds of security. So in a way, you know, global health is linked to that, all of them. So we, everything is important. That's why, you know, all the recent pandemics and everything has taught us that global solidarity is the first thing. The international cooperation must be uh, always there. Otherwise, you know, we can't attack this common uh, problem. And global health diplomacy plays the role uh, in bringing together. So in my study, you know, it's a slice of the PhD research, but basically I have used the summative global governance theory and I have seen the IHRs and the, the Port of Spain declaration, which is for the NCDs, which is a bottom up policy from Trinidad and Tobago started in Port of Spain. That's why it's named. So these are the two policies I've seen. And uh, I also did a qualitative research uh, interviewing experts in different domains. And uh, I don't want to go too much deep in this uh, theoretical framework, but basically the summative glo global governance, basically uh, it talks about that. I mean, you know, since as I mentioned, global health diplomacy is multidisciplinary. So the governance here is also the same. So that's why I took this particular theory for my, which is very much applicable to my research because you have different kinds of stakeholders, formal, non-formal, state and non-state global, local, and again, you have public-private partnerships. Again, you have civil society. So it is very much a uh, very meshy network. And that is what Summit of Global Governance talks. So to give a snapshot of these stakeholders of the players, you can see at the central core here, you know, you have the, the core organizations which are having the power or to take, to prepare an agreement or to have a hard loss or soft loss in any way. So. And outer layer, you have, you know, the individual donors, philanthropies, who has impact on the governments, basically. And outer, you will see professional bodies, research organizations, INGOs, and all. And the, the, the field, or, you know, the base, basically, the community, and all, you know, the religious organizations, social activities, that is the community, basically. So that is the wider thing. But the issue here is they, they are interlinked. They are connected to each other. They have their channels of communication. And it becomes so complicated. And that's why, you know, it is called a summative global governance. And when we talk about one particular health issue, it is not so simple. It really has so many implications and so much impact through these players. Uh, you, this slide- yeah, Just so you know, you've got about a, a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this slide is basically to show the participants for the research and the various themes who came out of is like, you know, global diplomacy, uh, how it can be useful, or what are the different traditional roles or emerging perspectives and the scope and all that. So it, the impact has shown in different dimensions for impact on economy, economy on cooperation, strengthening health systems. And these are the recent uh, outcomes of the global diplomacy. Like, you know, some of them I already discussed to you and the COVAX facility pandemic treaty, which are in process. So these are some of the publications which have done on that. You can Google that. But I want to conclude that basically, you know, these pandemics or any threat, you know, globally happening, they must be seen through a wider perspective, through multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach. And basically the groups, the new groups like C, G7, G20 have a greater role to play. Right now it is happening in India. So they have to actually uh, dedicate some funding for development and properly finance the systems, improve the health systems. And I would like to conclude that global health diplomacy as a soft power has a great potential and it can actually link many other disciplines. So in a way, health in all policy approach is something that can be negotiated through global health diplomacy, which can be a game changer for many countries. Uh, with this, I conclude my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Great, thanks Vijay. Um, Sally is next. Sally. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, PJ, for setting the scene. Uh, I think you mentioned a lot of key points that are, yeah, make my, my job much easier you know, to share what that means in practice. Um, I wonder if you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Let me see. 
lovely. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we will, I'm not really start from the scratch because uh, VJ, he already invested a lot in setting the scene, framing what we were keen to talk about. Um, I'm just keen here to uh, say why particularly we started to focus on um, health diplomacy in humanitarian settings and post and conflict and post-conflict uh, setting is majorly because of the limited visibility uh, and the space for these kinds of voices to be represented. Exactly as BJ um, showed us this uh, beautiful illustration about the influence and who get to influence the global health agenda. Uh, we can obviously see that we cannot see Africa CDC, we cannot see um, lower and middle income countries, we cannot see humanitarian uh, context, we cannot see people from humanitarian context, we, their voices and uh, perspectives are very rarely heard and seen. And that was one of the reasons why we started to focus on this. This work is part of our efforts in the decolonization of global health and decolonization of humanitarian health uh, at the school, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And here we would like to challenge a little bit the traditional framing of health diplomacy that's usually portrayed as uh, um, uh, citizens from the global north trying to uh, to conduct different acts of health diplomacy for usually uh, uh, either in the global level or for citizens in the global south. And that's something we really need to, to challenge if, if we are seeing the complete picture and what part of the picture is missing. And this is a little bit of a, a very small trial to kind of, yeah, illustrate what we have here as well. Um, I echo uh, Vijay's uh, definition of what is um, global health uh, um, diplomacy and what is citizen diplomacy. And here we're using uh, the, the definition that it's a multi-tiered informal networks and, cha and channels that influence and help in, 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 in shaping and influencing different decisions, particularly in humanitarian settings when it gets to health service availability. Uh, access uh, and all the different initiatives when it gets to health service. Um, when we were talking about why we're keen to examine these kinds of humanitarian settings or what is a humanitarian settings, uh, I think the, the most, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that we're now keen to, to share with you an experience of a very challenging context. This may not be the norm. This may not be the common case in most of the countries. So this might be a really, really extreme challenging situation for uh, with very scarce access to services, very scarce access to basic needs. And that's why um, citizens diplomacy comes here very handy. This is also a context where there are a lot of international political dimensions and action, and usually a lot of formal diplomacy falls short here at this stage because of the different sanctions, UN Security Council sanctions, and that's why the role of informal networks, the role of citizen diplomacy, the role of acceptance of for different members become really handy in negotiating multiple things. So. What can they negotiate? What can they advocate for? What kind of diplomacy that they would be keen to examine that can be including very various big menu, basically, starting from uh, access, humanitarian access, or delivering of health services for specific areas, uh, to procuring large scale uh, uh, vaccines, including uh, the cholera vaccines or COVID-19. And we will see this in depth through the three key, uh, case studies that we are examining today. Uh, so I just wanted to say that it's a really wide uh, spectrum of what kind of uh, diplomacy efforts can contribute to in the health. Um, yeah. But let's maybe start by giving a little bit of introduction and please uh, excuse me if, if some of these details are really too much or like too compl complex. But we're here to, keen to, to focus on three key studies. The first one will be Iraq being one of the oldest humanitarian set, not oldest, but I mean a little bit the oldest of the three that we've discussed today, um, which, which currently exhibits a mix between internally displacement uh, humanitarian settings. That means people from the same country are moving from one place to another after the war uh, uh, with, with, with ISIS or ISIL. Uh, and in the same time, they are hosting Syrian refugees who cross the border from Syria. So they are hosting both internal displacement and external displacement refugee context. 
At the same time, we have here the case of Syria, which you might be familiar of, um, which is some sort of inter internal civil war um, uh, and that led the country to be under multiple uh, authorities and mul multiple administrative control. Uh, so we have the South is majorly under the uh, the control of the Assad regime and then the Northeast and the Northwest one under the control of the Turkish um, authorities and another one under the Free Syrian uh, opposition. Um, and with that kind of different authorities comes a lot of questions about access, right? How can we deliver one uh, uh, human, the one track basically be humanitarian assistance or surgical equipment or malnutrition support for children or um, whatever kind of health supplies or medicine we would like to deliver from point A to point B and where will be point A and will be point B and what's the citizen role in facilitating this access? Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll expand a little bit on that. Um, and then the third country that we'll discussing today, it's a really here in the South, Yemen. It's uh, the country that has been going through both internal conflict and also uh, external with the with Saudi Arabia maybe and the GCC, some of the GCC countries. Um, it's important to highlight that the three countries have totally different humanitarian situations. So for example, despite uh, Yemen being the kind of the, the most recent humanitarian setting among the three, they have the worst se severity of needs um, because of mainly the conditions before the war and the conditions. It's also important to highlight that the health system and existing infrastructure among the three countries are also totally different. I mean, if you can compare Iraq, which is a relatively um, middle higher income country, relatively oil rich country with adequate revenues and resources to Yemen, which have very limited resources, very poor with very fragile infrastructure, a very fragile health system, pre-war uh, pre uh, maternal mortality was very high and all of these things in mind, that's also something to put in mind that, yeah, they might be all in the same region or they're all um, having challenges or going through humanitarian crisis, but they have totally different dynamics, different engagement with actors and different uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, so let's start with the, with the case of Syria. So, um, here we are, uh, we're trying to illustrate a couple of examples about how the citizen diplomacy in health has been illustrated, starting from very small individual or community level initiatives to, and we're expanding as we go down to more higher level uh, or more organized type of citizen engagement, including groups of diaspora, groups of NGOs, um, groups of organized uh, organizations and how they can manage to, to, to deliver um, and to advocate for change. So starting from the very small grassroots community level uh, experiences, uh, the UN and multiple uh, multiple organizations documented how far the women have been having a leading role in transporting and smuggling uh, medical supplies, particularly in besieged areas in Zabadani um, five years ago. Um, in besieged areas are usually areas that are where no access, no one can basically go or enter. There is denial of humanitarian assistance to these areas as a way of uh, warfare. Um, and these areas are usually restricted for uh, for men to go to enter or to leave, and there are a lot of uh, yeah, it's basically a war zone, yeah. But that kind of uh, of restriction, um, some women are exempted for that kind of restriction, and this is how they use it to smuggle or kind of transport a lot of different medical supplies. Um, and that has been documented multiple times, but very strongly documented in Zabadani in particular in Syria. So they didn't really stop at kind of that kind of mobilizing and sharing and providing the medical supplies to the uh, to the uh, to the hospitals through a very well studied and um, uh, what do you call it trusted uh, network of volunteers and medical health professionals, but also they developed a different community health initiatives 
to advance um, uh, to advance community health programs. With, as you probably may have heard, there are multiple health facilities in the city has been bombed or destructed. They have been not no longer available. That's why there is heavy reliance on community health uh, initiatives. And many of these community health workers have even um, advanced almost nurse qualifications, so they can provide some sort of advanced treatment. So they have been uh, providing a lot of uh, negotiation as well with some of the political actors into how to, to, to get access to some of the areas, how they can provide care to these areas, how they can portray the, the kind of work that they do in a way that is um, neutral. By time, multiple studies, in particular, the study in 2020 and uh, the colleagues from John Hopkins documented the impact of this kind of community level initiatives on building trust between the different compacting um, teams and, uh, and, uh, uh, and communities. Particularly if these community uh, initiatives are moving from one, uh, for example, pro uh, asset uh, village to another one, which is cross line or another one that is mixed, how the role has been really linked to that. Um, and linked to that kind of community health initiative, there have been also a role about for um, uh, state citizen diplomacy and cross line transportation, which means how far the citizens can impact the, the state in, in, in the diplomacy efforts, but also how far they can um, negotiate the supply of medicine and services, health services between areas under the authority of the regime and areas under the authority of different groups, including non-state actors. And here we have very limited evidence or very limited um, evidence says what exactly that says, but still it's, it's, it's emerging area to be discovering, yeah? Um, one, one also um, action that was very interesting to observe, particularly in the Syria um, uh, case, and that was not as visible in both Iraq uh, uh, and Yemen, is the role of diaspora in health diplomacy. So the, in Syria in particular, there are very um, strong NGOs who are being established in the US and the UK, including SAMS, including um, uh, the British, uh, the British uh, Syrian society, uh, all of these uh, organizations who have, have had a really huge leverage in, in negotiating access. Uh, I remember when I used to work in, 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 in for the Syria response, I think uh, one of these organizations was the only one who could move their ambulances from point A to B to C to D. And that kind of moving an ambulance, which, which can seem like a very, very, you know, simple, simple action to done that requires negotiating with almost eight stakeholders, eight non, 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 um, um, what do you call it, non, non state actors. Uh, and their presence as neutral or diaspora actors give them the kind of leverage so they can negotiate and have more access better than the ones in the ground or the international organizations where sometimes their presence are usually politicized with one of the conflicting parties. So that was also very interesting to, to observe how they managed to, 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 uh, to get to negotiate for medical monitoring, for, for even for funding, mobilizing resources, how can they um, uh, negotiate for operational support and also um, the more most important was access. Um, most recently, we observed their role in mobilizing cross-border operations and relief in the in the earthquake, um, and that was also something that we clearly uh, observed. For the sake of time, I'll really wrap up. To yeah, you have, a, you have you have about uh, less than three minutes. Oh, okay, I'll be very brief. <laughs> then, uh, with the with the yeah, with lastly. SAMS, along, uh, which is the Syrian American Medical Society, along with 32 other humanitarian organizations, advocated for the extension of the Un United Nations Security Council decision to reauthorize the Security Council de uh, decision, which basically enabled them to uh, deliver humanitarian aid from outside of Syria to inside Syria, which is what we call it cross-border. That means they can deliver aid from different uh, passages. Uh, for the case of Iraq, I think this has been actually one of my favorite cases, which is how far the community driven by their ethnic pro proximity to the uh, from the Syrian refugees started advocating at the start of the Syrian refugee uh, the, um, presence in Kurdistan, Iraq, that they would be integrated in the national health system. They didn't really only advocate for them offering them services. They just went the whole way to advocate for full integration. 
And by the time the internal displacement happened to 2014, that was the norm that um, displaced communities regard being refugees or internally displaced population to be integrated in the national health systems and being treated equally, just in equal manner as the Kurdish citizen, which is not, by the way, the case in federal Iraq. So if the if those population, particularly Syrian refugees, move outside of Kurdistan Iraq, they will have to they will be totally outside of the system. So that kind of approach uh, was really important, and there, the level of inclusion has been now discussed to being included even in the new health insurance scheme and the new, um, universal health coverage, and also the COVID-19 vaccines have been integrated, fully integrated. Uh, lastly, the case of Yemen, uh, which is something very interesting because um, um, I'll, I'll focus more about the vaccine diplomacy and the hesitancy in, in Yemen and how far the uh, multiple actors or, yeah, have been influencing the vaccine dynamics in, in, in Yemen. Oops. So if we see here in the 7th of May to 2021, Saudi Arabia took a, a key decision to mandate uh, vaccine certificates for any foreign workers or anyone who traveled to Saudi Arabia. And that was a substantial uh, key event that influenced the vaccine dynamics in Yemen. As probably some of you have known, the Yemen didn't really, uh, was falling apart in most of the vaccine procurement, including Gavi and COVAX, and they received a very limited number of doses. Uh, some of these doses were from Saudi Arabia it itself and from Gavi as well. Uh, in the beginning, there was opposition, a lot of politicization of how to, of the vaccination process. So the, um, the de facto government was, was including the Ministry of Health, who were saying a lot of statements about how they don't really trust the vaccine. And they showed a little bit of politicization of how they use the vaccine. In the same time, the vaccine that they were procured through Gavi, the UN and the uh, KSR, uh, King Salman Relief Center, they were mainly available in the internationally recognized areas rather than the de facto areas. Uh, what we here observed was and was fascinating how far the communities were smuggling vaccine to the other areas so they can offer it in the other uh, areas that are not really um, under the same authority. Um, we have multiple UN reports, including WHO and UNICEF, have been showing how far the, the communities they facilitated the uh, transfer and how uh, the communities and family members and even people that they don't know they would go and uh, have the vaccine registered. Um, they booked the vaccine appointment basically for someone that they don't know, and how far they were. Uh, uh, an informal structure over WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups for people who would like to go to an area where they have the vaccine provided and people would just go and, and book it for them. So documenting that kind of grassroots initiatives and, and work is really substantial because um, unlike everything that we see in the global health diplomacy, we just go for negotiations and UN, um, UN negotiation processes as as my colleague was mentioning, all the IHR discussions and the World Health Assembly discussions and the pandemic treaty, but we 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 don't really understand how the the health diplomacy works on the grassroots level, and that's why we really need to yeah. In my we think it's fascinating to see all these amazing initiatives happening either from from internet uh, internally uh, citizens or from people abroad. So. Yeah, and we think that's, uh, that should be definitely a priority to document and understand and examine a lot, and also try to have more diverse representation of opinion what uh, health diplomacy is. I'll stop here, thank you. Great, Sally. Um, thank you um, for both of your presentations. We have about 35 minutes um, for discussion. I want to first, before I forget, um, take a photo of everybody. Um, so if you could, uh, for those of you who do not have your cameras on, if you could turn them on, um, briefly at least, um, so that I can take a photo of everyone uh, for our records. We will share this with the broader audience. Um, on three, I'm going to um, ask you to smile. One, two, three, smile. Awesome. And let me take another photo just quickly. On three, one, two, three, smile. Great. Um, so uh, to begin the discussion, um, I figured so we have what I'm going to do is a number of you, thank you for posting your 
um, questions in the chat. You also can post comments. Um, so feel free, because again, I want to emphasize that what you post in the chat will be shared with a much broader audience. We have a, uh, nearly 1,200 people uh, involved in um, uh, or connected to the citizen, to Citizen Diplomacy International. And so they will receive these photos, the video recording, and the Zoom chat um, from this meeting. So by all means, if you have questions, please post them. Uh, and I'm going to kind of um, go through what you've indicated in the Zoom chat and just um, call on you to... Uh, to kind of ask your question or questions. Um, so let's start with Matt um, Taranchik. Um, uh, do you want to pose, do you have, do you want to start with any kind of like factual informational questions or clarifications, Matt? Hold on one second. I'm looking at my, uh, my notes here. I think the first thing that I wanted to, uh, I guess, get a little bit more of an understanding was, um, for uh, Dr. Hafez, um, you had talked about in the very beginning of your presentation uh, of decolonizing the current infrastructure of, of um, healthcare and that flow from the global north to the global south. I'm unfamiliar with that and what that means. We're, we're having that trouble, uh, Matt, um, hearing you. Um, uh, so if you, if you can somehow switch your or adjust. Um, You were doing so well. Okay. I apologize. Is this better? Yes. All right. Uh, so I, I apologize. Um, so I had been uh, very curious, just as a clarification point uh, for Dr. Hafez, um, you were uh, talking about that, that um, decolonizing the current uh, healthcare infrastructure and the framework uh, as it currently stands, you said it flows from the global north to the global south. I'm not quite sure what that means. And how might this alternative framework look like? Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. Um, that's a very good question. Um, by decolonizing the traditional framework refers to um, exactly what uh, Vijay has been showing us, who is making the influence in global uh, global health diplomacy is usually um, some specific actors. Uh, the absolute majority of them are based in the global north who are shaping the narrative and the notion of what is global health uh, diplomacy. Uh, if we take an example, for example, uh, about the vaccine production or the vaccine diplomacy, or if we're talking another example, which is now the key discussion, which is the pandemic uh, uh, preparedness and pandemic treaty, the, these have been all discussions dominated and shaped in the global north by global north actors. And within this space, there are very limited representation of the views and the perspectives from different countries, which should be the case, right? Um, from sharing this example about what these kinds of uh, discussions may look like, we, do, we don't really propose any framework because we don't have the, a, a clear idea what the con alternative conceptual framework would look like, but we're just drawing the attention that this discussion is not uh, equitable. We don't have representation of equitable voices. Uh, so following that, uh, there there's um, a couple of questions, one which is uh, one mine, but um, I wanna turn to um, Rosa Torademe. Uh, Tora de me. Um, if I, if I, um, if she's, if I believe she's still with us, um, Rosa, I'm wondering if you can ask your question. Actually, you know what? I don't know if she is with yes, us. Yes, yes, I'm here. Oh, there you are. I'm okay. Here. Sorry. Um, I, I have sometimes a hard time seeing who I'm supposed to be seeing. Um, if you could ask your question, I guess. Um, I, I like your question in part because you're asking about um, so uh, health budgets and who decides health budgets, but this gets to this broader question I had likewise, um, because my concern about the kind of the talk about global north and global south, which is important, right, and the 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 neglect of um, uh, the 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 global south or voices from the global south is that it's not just a matter of hearing more from the global south, but rather hearing more from citizens rather than uh, elites. Um, and so, and that, because you could have more voices from the global south, but the ones that are gonna come forward are basically professionals um, in the health field uh, who are happy to kind of uh, be heard, et cetera, and so forth. But given that health is so vital to our lives, 
um, it, that our health is interconnected um, and that participation, really wide participation in public health is essential for creating kind of robust um, healthcare systems, it seems to me that the issue is not just one of global south uh, uh, versus global north, but one of citizens versus elites. Um, and how do we kind of empower uh, citizens in a way that perhaps Rosa might be suggesting? So Rosa, I'm wondering if you can kind of uh, uh, ask. Yes, us. sure. So my question was based especially um... Yeah, as you know, the crisis, economic crisis in 2008 affected uh, a lot Spain. And one of the main sectors that uh, suffered uh, was the health system, meaning that suddenly um, the budget uh, for the health system was uh, reduced very much. And in the end, we are having things like the doctors only have five minutes per patient, for example. And I'm wondering what uh, people can do in this case, because in the end, we have been seeing that, all of us, but... Uh, concrete actions that we could do. Maybe there are not so many few, or maybe I, I, I just wanted to know if you have some inspiration or do you have some concrete examples where, where people could uh, influence the decisions of the government to, to, to go against uh, the, this direction, to, to go back to, to the, the budget we had in the past, for example, or even increase that. And perhaps Vijay, if you can um, start uh, to respond first. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Actually, you no, know, it is um very, you know, it's not a straightforward answer. It depends upon the country. It depends upon how much budget they are allocating. Actually, in general, because if you look at the budget allocation, you know, it differs from countries to countries. You have a country, you know, at some point, you know, Sri Lanka, for example, you know, it was spending like uh, six, seven percent or eight percent, something like that. It's spending more than India, and the health indicators were very good i mean compared to you know not after the economic crisis and all before that if you look at other countries you know they spend on average uh, anywhere between seven eight but you know india never reached that level it was always you know two two point five three like that so what i mean to say here is that the country every country has its own problems and you know it depends upon their economy also so you know if for example in developing countries like uh, paul was mentioning global south has a triple burden of diseases one is infectious disease second is chronic diseases and third one is related to climate change or you know food uh, inaccess or drought or you know all kind of disasters whatever you know so you have three major uh, problems there if you come to developed countries, again, you know, the focus is more on prevention and, you know, chronic disease because you don't have malaria problem. You don't have tuberculosis problem that much. You don't have other, you know, tropical diseases, what the global south has, right? So these are the uh, certain things. But it's now coming back to the funding allocation, that is very tricky. But, you know, NGOs do have a big voice because I mean, you have a very big lobby. They have lobbies, for example, the World Economic Forum that itself is part of its lobby of NGOs, right? And now, you know, everything, they use the technology, they are coming up with many strategies and uh, they are in a way directly talking to the head of the states during the forum. Right? You got an opportunity to speak to the head of the state directly about the problem, the journalists, or, you know, basically, you know, you need not only diplomacy at times, you need, I think, you know, the citizens' activism. Activism has a, a you know, a great impact because, you see, even NGOs, where they are coming from, they are coming from basically the voices of people. So, in a way, I think, you know, for example, Oxfam, it, it is doing good work. You have human rights uh, organizations, which is working for humans, safeguarding human rights. For example, when Ebola epidemic came, MSF was very proactive. MSF has given certain guidelines and all. So the government have improved their health budgets to improve the surveillance, to strengthen the surveillance systems. They have extra budget for having infrastructure, having the nurse staff and all that. So uh, it is very subjective and case to case. And, you know, you don't have a global model to say, oh, you know, if you spend 5%, it's good. If you spend 10%, it's good. Look at US. It is spending enormously every year. It goes on increasing. But, you know, if you see the infant mortality rate or other indicators, you know, there are countries which are spending less than what US is spending, but doing better than US, to be frank. I mean, there are... So, you know, it is not the amount of money you spend, but I think, you know, it is also like, you know, where the money is going, you are spending. But then, you know, if all your money is just taken away, the insurance companies or the pharma industry like that, again, you know, you have to see how it is balanced. Uh, it is very complex. It is a very complex phenomenon. We have to 
uh, really figure it out like what is the problem and what you have to look at a trend and you know the group of economists group of health professionals the finance minister edu education minister health minister so you know they all need to sit together do this exercise not just for the sake of doing regularly for their budgeting but you know to make some uh, changes or you know for example covid has given a good example for that mm. people they don't ignore health anymore now because now the health in all policies was proposed in way back in 2007 in Adelaide conference. No one cared about that. But now after COVID came, now they realize because the whole business, the supply chains, everything is depending on. If, if the workforce is dying, you can't ignore, right? So yeah, I, I want to cut short here, but the thing is, the question is very complicated and uh, yeah, it has to be, but NGOs do have a big voice. They can do a big change because they have done a lot of uh, significant changes in the past, even now. Okay, Sally. Um, yeah, it's a very hard question, to be honest. I mean, I can maybe uh, speak a little bit to, to more of citizen activism. And in my opinion, that would be the way to focus on. And there is also now a parallel track coming up in research, which we call it um, co-production and co-creation, how far we can be led by how the communities define the questions, what's important for them, what kind of questions that you want to be asked. So being really humble and that takes a lot that takes a lot of uh, of changes for us as researchers but also for our institutions and for also the journals right when you publish i don't know co-creation with the communities about vaccines or whatever versus you know publishing i don't know quantitative analysis or modeling they definitely prefer that people trust that more than the, the community perception and that's unfortunate but i think there's definitely a, a, a road that is worth investing in and having more studies and more people and more uh, critical mass advocating for this and i think that has been a fascinating way to to voice the perspectives of the communities at least in the research we're doing uh, to be totally led by them i totally agree with the point that you mentioned paul about how the difference between not everyone from the global south is just you know a representative community because you know the elitist people come with different intersectionalities and position of power so who also is represented in this discussion is absolutely important um i i kind of have mixed feelings about working with ngos and civil societies i feel that they are um they are an excellent way to voice up activism ideas but not the, the um, what they call it the professionalization how far more most of these voices activist voices became professional that limits their activism abilities and how far they can go and challenge the system and really speak up through to the power so that kind of really tricky balance between how we can make their voices visible at the high level global health advocacy but in the same time not fully professional you know not another NGO. myself i used to be <laughs> a un person and all of that i mean <laughs> it kind of kills your soul so uh yeah i would say these kind of two things hmm. so i mean i just to kind of maybe wrap up and challenge you guys on this on this conversation about kind of representation really which is the uh, um a, a way of summarizing what this this problem is um, you have kind of a, a health system which is largely dominated by elites um, and citizens are affected. Uh, COVID has only underscored that because it affected our, our lives across the world. Um, so health is so fundamental. It affects num large numbers of people. And yet our health system basically um, is designed to kind of like um, push information out rather than draw information in um from from the grassroots from publics and i think you're right ali that there's this kind of there's this um a professional cadre within within ngos right and they have their own interests and everybody um you know we're all professionals uh, uh who are interested in kind of uh, promoting ourselves having the cameras in front of us and so on but the reality is um uh, uh publics need to be involved and so Activism is one answer, which you guys have suggested, but it's clearly not the only answer for the reason that you suggested, Sully, which is that um, themselves, the, the heads of these NGOs, these activists tend to be more privileged. So part of the answer, and I'll, I'll throw it into the, um, the Zoom chat, maybe this concept of democratic sortition, um, 
where you're actually, and I think Sally, you were suggesting this, where you're randomly selecting publics, uh, whether at a community level or a country level or an international level, random selection means you're going to get plumbers, you're going to get um, uh, farm workers, you're going to get all kinds of people. And those people are asked about healthcare, um, uh, what they want, what they need, um, the problems they're facing, et cetera, and so forth. And that shapes policy um, uh, and that, and and then the experts can basically be assistants, and the professionals can be assistants to these publics, rather than people trying to kind of goad people to participate when they're in fact not really participating. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there, and I'll I'll put the concept in here. But I think we need to think much more fundamentally about citizen diplomacy and the ways in which citizens can be genuinely involved. Uh, and above and beyond just normal activism and actual representation in decision making. So um, I want to turn to, oh, oh uh, Brian, did you want to add? I something? would actually just like to, to add and, and put this question out there too. I think the, the, the one sort of community that we haven't really talked a whole lot about is uh, doctors and nurses. And, you know, and, and I think it, my question would sort of speak to um, some of the concerns about the, the North and the South and um, the problem of brain drain, which of course is, is a thing. And that, that sort of um, presents certain impediments to, to health systems uh, to actually function as they should. And it also, I think, ties into what Vijay was saying about the health systems themselves and all the different uh, actors within the governments and everything and, and funding issues. Um, how do you all see the actual sort of, you know, and, and they are in, the, in, in themselves, the doctors and the nurses, sort of citizen diplomats in, in terms of, uh, you know, either being private citizens and working in, in private practices in different communities, um, but also for, for public health systems as well. Um, how do you all see the, the state of, of play for um, the actual medical professionals who are training and what they need and, and how they're sort of plugging into all of these networks that, that you all are describing. Yeah, if I could, I'm sorry that I missed the first half hour of the discussion. I'm Jimmy Colker. I was U.S. Foreign Service officer for a long time and then became a small, tiny fish in this pond of health diplomacy. And that, I think Brian's question goes to a really important evolution that we've seen in this century, which is that we really in health shouldn't be talking about donors and recipients and developed and less developed countries. We're talking about a community of practice. And every country now has the critical mass of health professionals, doctors and nurses, but also throughout the, the health care, the uh, care of the giver and, and provision of health services, there's actually considerable capacity in almost every country in the world. And the point is, how do they bring their own systems up to first world standards? How do they assure the access, quality, and cost of services uh, can meet the needs of their populations, especially those that have been marginalized or, or might be vulnerable? And that question is one where citizen diplomacy seems to be absolutely at the core. There's a group out in New Mexico called Project ECHO that has expanded by a factor of 20 during COVID because as people couldn't travel and do things face to face, they've developed this community of practice um, model in which it's also quite horizontal because it means that um, people who are involved at all levels, doctors who are sometimes hierarchical, but also um, everybody involved in, in patient access and care can talk about common issues that they're facing and look for best practices and ideas from other places. And I think in talking about the brain drain now, there's we're certainly looking at what we're calling brain circulation. We don't want to restrict the freedom of uh, professionals who are trained in whatever country from improving their professional qualifications by working in another country or, or getting additional training. On the other hand, the diasporas that you were talking about, um, Sally, in, in your uh, response are really important because as those, uh, as there are immigrants who are professionals come to countries like the United States, the idea that they're taking a keen interest in their countries of origin and are circulating back and helping to be mentors to professionals in those countries is very much part of what we're talking about. So this is not restricting individual freedoms, 
but at the same time looking at increasing the quality of the institutions, the research institutions and the uh, public and private hospitals, the um, entire panoply of organizations in the health sector that um, can take advantage of the uh, excellent training that's being available now, both in the global north and the global south. Sorry for that. Um, I'm sorry if I covered things that have already been covered. No, no, no. I'm glad, uh, Jimmy, that you're you're participating, given your kind of long experience uh, um, in in the federal government in the U.S. Um, on these issues. Um, uh, so, uh, VJ or Sally, if you have any responses here, and then would love to hear from others among you that haven't spoken yet. Um, but go ahead, VJ or Sally. Uh, I'm happy to start, and Vijay, please feel free to uh, to jump. Uh, I'll be very brief um, regarding the point of the role of doctors and nurses. I think it depends where, and depends what kind of systems and relations and hierarchical relations between the, pa the, the community, the patient, and also the service provider. But uh, focusing on the point of brain drain, because this is a super interesting point for me personally, and before Starting, I have to put this disclaimer that migration of anyone is a right, and we absolutely acknowledge this as a right. But from a health system perspective, and from a context where resource allocations are very scarce, um, most healthcare providers that are I get that they got their education, received their education in lower and middle income countries, the, um, they receive that at uh, either a very low cost or um, sub heavily subsidized by the state. That means that the state and their countries already invested so much in their qualification and their learnings. And for them to go and work in another country, that means a huge financial loss for these countries from a pure health system financing perspective. Um, again, I'm not talking from a rights perspective. Uh, it's also important to note that $1 in lower middle income country is not equal for $1 in the US and that kind of investment that a middle income country would put in the education of a nurse or a midwife or um, a doctor is totally different and for them to invest that much that, it, that means that they prioritize that and they could have spent that money in another thing. Um, there are a lot of arguments about the role of brain drain in, in a lot of things. Uh, most recently in the World Health Assembly, there was um, a very interesting panel about how far the COVID-19 uh, contributed to um, de-skilling of migrant workers in the UK. For all the nurses that will travel and went and come back to, came to work in the UK after the Brexit and uh, due to the very dif difficult registration system, many of them prefer to have registered as just a practicing nurse rather than advanced nurse because it's much harder, even if they received a very advanced nursing qualifications. And by that, that means they do really very simple nursing uh, stuff. And by time they found that they are de-skilled, they don't really practice what they have been trained for. Um, lastly, uh, from my experience working in humanitarian settings, and I'm not talking, I don't know how it goes in the other areas of the world, um, but uh, for the example that if for the first two years of displacement of the Syrian refugees, Germany received 6,500 Syrian doctors. That's a loss that will never be compensated, at least for the next 10 years for Syria. So just putting things into perspective. Mm. Wow, um, VJ. Yeah, I think you know, uh, like you know, she discussed, uh, Sally discussed about the Middle East perspective. But you know, even if I have to say something from Canada, there are so many professionals. I think you know, you have a highly talented, most of the masters and PhD and all. But the thing is, if you look in this. Uh, uh, registered or you know certified uh, workspaces with uh, professional association and registration there are many doctors like you know around if only in toronto city they must be around 3000 to 4000 doctors who are unable to practice who are not clearing the exam so you know it is a way like you know uh, there is we can think like brain drain people come here but then again you know there is no system uh, either they have to go through the education system back again into that or they have to spend a few years and try to pass the exams and come out. So for medical graduates, this has become like a nightmare in Canada. But coming to nursing, for example, but many countries took this uh, human resources for health as an opportunity to improve their 
um, economy in terms of you know the return of the investments. For example, India, Philippines, they have been you know uh, sending nurses to Middle East. They are sending nurses to Europe. Uh, and they, you have special programs and, you know, people also nowadays, you know, for doctors, now they are getting trained in the Caribbean so that they can come and uh, settle down in, you know, Canada or US. So, I mean, uh, there are many perspectives here. I mean, uh, first of all, the, the in their home country, probably the education one is the education opportunities may be less because, you know, the competition is very high. You have, uh, you don't get admitted there. So you try to go out of country, go to China, go to here, go there. So that is one thing but which is coming voluntarily. The other one is countries also using their human resources to gain the diplomacy or you know, to get their other uh, work done. For example, human doctors, you can find them in Venezuela. They go, you know, they go for an exchange for the oil. So this kind of activities also happen. China sends its own medical staff, doctors, nurses to Africa to have, you know, to do the business. So, I mean, it differs from uh, region to region. Uh, I think, you know, everyone is correct in their perspective, but the thing is uh, definitely, uh, you know, the, the major policy that is driving is as an individual, everyone feels that, you know, he or she wants to improve their career or, you know, become, you know, somewhat uh, generate some money or, you know, change their lifestyle or whatever. But end of the day, I think, you know, the policies of their uh, host country, if they are successful, I think if the host country is really uh, committed to, you know, fit them within their capacities or, you know, give them an opportunity, they will survive. Or, you know, I know many people got fed up and, you know, they move, even though they come to Canada, they go back or some people, you know, they don't want to do any more. So, I mean, uh, I see that kind of mixed things, especially in this part of the world. Yeah. It's but this has a lot of impact, uh, for example, the uh, brain drain, uh, again, you know, if it comes also a lot of burnout, for example, people who are already in the system now, now, you know, the whole working style is different and uh, getting to learn these things and all, you know, again, working extra shifts during the COVID-19. If I look at the other uh, people who are already settled from before, there's a huge load on them. I mean, there are a lot of expectations. The moment you go there, you expect you want a bed, you'll get a bed, you'll be given treatment and all. So, so there is again, you know, a lot of pressure on these healthcare workers, the nurses, medical lab technicians, and uh, a lot of burnout cases. And, you know, people are really, uh, I mean, you know, there were no people, even, you know, if they go on, they can't go on leave at the same time. And, you know, uh, it is a mixed uh, scenario. I mean, you know, it is not happy to share it. At the same time, they are not happy who are here, you know these kind of stories we hear, you know. So it's interesting to me that this kind of problem of brain drain is has come up because it seems to connect back to um, these problems of um, the fact that we have a highly unequal world, right? Um, and so that brain drain happens precisely because of that inequality. Um, there are some countries in which uh, political corruption and kind of elite capture of government reigns. And in those circumstances, there's less investment in health, there's less investment in education. And accordingly, um, uh, you know, people want to leave their countries um, because they're not getting adequate education in their own countries. And they're certainly not getting adequate health care in many cases. Um, and so it underscores, I guess, this point. I want to go back to something that uh, uh, Jimmy Colker said about, so there's brain drain and there's brain circulation. I'm wondering if you can kind of talk more, um, Jimmy, to this concept of brain circulation, because within this context of um, uh, citizen diplomacy and the ways in which citizen diplomacy might play a role in, you might say, kind of democratizing the health systems. Um, uh, so, so I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on this. I'm really uh, getting the sense that perhaps what needs to happen is much more conversation between the health sector globally and the democ the participatory democracy sector, because I get the sense that there's not all that much uh, knowledge within the health sector of how do you design systems to integrate public uh, opinion, uh, public participation in healthcare, given that it's so essential and there's wide recognition there seems um, in that, but it still seems that we err towards professionals rather than bringing in ordinary citizens into the process of not just decision-making, but implementation of healthcare. 
Um, so uh, Jimmy first, and then we'd love to hear from others among you. Uh, Mary Zaki is joining us from the American Red Cross. I don't know if she's paying attention, uh, but um, we'd love to hear from her as well and anybody else who uh, wants to contribute to this conversation. Um, Jimmy? Thanks. I'll contribute a little bit from a diplomatic perspective. Because health is the kind of archetypical national responsibility, even within the European Union, there's a subsidiarity clause, which in the, I'm sorry, the woman from Spain is no longer here, but the ability of the European Union even to surge medical professionals within the union, uh, their inability to do that was a huge obstacle when Spain and Italy were the hotspots, for instance, for COVID there. And the, they've realized that, that this, the, the borders are a problem. And at the same time, when we have an outbreak, everyone's first instinct is to limit travel and to have a kind of vaccine or care nationalism, which I know you've talked about. And so the question of how do we make proactive diplomacy part of our health response, and that would include questions of how do we surge personnel, how do we uh, prevent personnel who are in a conflict area or in a health area, like from the Ebola countries in West Africa, from being prohibited from returning to from traveling or being in other countries, there, there's a almost a, a, a trapped in the in an area when you've gone to help. And then the question also of the tradition of citizen cooperation of what's now said, I think rightly somewhat pejoratively, is volunteerism of medical professionals and others going to provide two weeks of help in some poor country for needy patients which tends to distort the health system in those countries, not provide follow-up care and not make health an inherent responsibility of the communities themselves, the, the family caregivers and so on. So how we turn those that volunteer tourism into a sense of genuine trying to connect places where there are resources to places that have identified needs and might benefit from resources from outside the community or from outside the country. And I think they're, the NGOs, citizen groups are a vital link and, and information source for how do we do this? And then at the higher level, to be sure that our only response when there's an outbreak is not to evacuate citizens and cut down embassy sizes, but to see health as a real opportunity to engage and to see what are the comparative advantages that a country like the US might have and how do those apply in country acts where that embassy should be looking for areas of cooperation, not ways to evacuate our own citizens. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Jimmy. Others who'd like to, who haven't um, uh, participated yet, would love to hear from you. So, Sujata, uh, Maybell, Mary, Adam, and uh, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Waria. I can go ahead. Hi, everyone. This is Mary. Uh, first of all, I would love to thank uh, all the presenters today. Thank you so much for that. And um, I would like also to give credit to the uh, case studies because this is how we learn and uh, this is how actually learning could be more uh, relevant. And I would love to know more, maybe a second session or maybe a special presentation on how this is all linked to and how this is all could be linked to policy rooms and policy making procedures rather than just like knowing that this happened over like a span of years after the war in Syria or Iraq or Yemen, but how in such similar situations, especially under the current circumstances within the current world, and we have more countries that are subject to war or natural disasters or like conflict um, um, affected areas, how can we leverage the learning from those case studies and link them to policy making? Uh, this is very important. I would love also to tackle the idea of uh, brain drain and sometimes it could reach to the brain damage to some of the people coming from the south for not having their voices heard and uh, one of the also uh, very interesting case studies with UN Women, uh, the study that linked the economic barriers of uh, the violence and, and inflicted over women. So maybe, and I'm not a researcher within this area, but say, and, and anyone that can provide us with more, more information about the research that was done on this, on how this also affects 
economies of countries, like how when the narrative is purely coming from the north and it's not um, it's not centric on on citizens from the ground, how this is all impacting uh, uh, the economy and how we can link that to the policy uh, making procedures. Thank you so much again. Thanks, Mary. Um... Uh, so, so uh, I've asked uh, Sujata um, to to kind of uh, chime in on a question that he's posed. But before we do that, um, actually, you know what? We need to we need to we probably need to um, wrap things up. We're at one twenty five. I just realized, Sujata, I I I very much apologize um, after asking you if you could uh, if you could speak. But I do do want to um, raise people's attention to. Um, his question. I'm not sure if it's a he. Uh, Sujata, where 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 are you calling from? And um, if you could just hi, I boss. No problem. Um, I'm calling from United States. I'm a PhD student here. Um, thanks for the presentation. I don't want to waste anyone else's time right now. <laughs> yeah, and, and sorry. Um, so thanks for sorry. thanks for uh, thanks for speaking up. And um, uh, but we will, um, as I mentioned, share your questions to the um. Uh, to the wider audience um, for this Citizen Diplomacy International. So everything that you've posted in the Zoom chat will be shared out. Um, I do want to ask uh, in these last few minutes, um, Brian Smith to introduce himself. Um, and also I will share my screen and show you the most recent issue of the Citizen Diplomacy Bulletin as he speaks, because he'll basically kind of show you the bulletin. Um, uh, our meetings are now quarterly rather than six times a year. For the last couple of years, they were six times a year. They're now quarterly. Um, and uh, we, uh, uh, with every meeting, produce a Citizen Diplomacy Bulletin um, or CDI Bulletin. So Brian, do you want to introduce yourself while I share on screen uh, the latest bulletin? Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, so I'm Brian. I've just become the co-editor of this document that he's about to share, and I am um, currently um, an art dealer. Um, I have worked and actually worked in medicine. My my father is a physician. Um, I worked with him for many years. Um, I have worked in museums. I have uh, done, you know, trying starting a, a a business of my own where civil discourse and diplomacy is is going to be a big deal, and um, I'm excited to be here and going deeper into diplomacy with this organization. And so, as you see, as he's scrolling, uh, this this change over from CDRG, uh, which is indeed a, a mouthful, uh, it's sort of flows with CDI a little bit more, and, and you might also see that that, that name is actually now available uh, <laughs> because the other organization that went by that name, Citizen Diplomacy International, uh, has now merged with another group and they're based in Philadelphia. Um, but uh, so you see you know, the different events and, and as I pick these events, uh, first and foremost, the, the goal is to have a, a globally diverse list uh, that's not always, you know, pos it's it's possible, but but I would I would just throw it out there that um, please do if anybody has any events in your home countries uh, that that you think are are worthwhile to share, uh, please please send those on to Paul um, and and we can we can we can get those in the bulletin and also uh, since these are quarterly meetings now. Uh, you know, not everything going on is going to be chronological or sort of relevant based on the calendar. So you can always send those to the Facebook group and, and post them there. Um, but some interesting books and 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 articles and in particular, uh, my editorial principle is in this in this regard is to kind of focus on the topic of the meeting and also follow up from previous meetings and sort of looking ahead towards uh, towards future future gatherings online. Um, but just trying to also find some some sort of interesting uh, text that that may you know not always get uh, get in. Particularly this uh, license to travel: a cultural history of the passport. I found that to be very fascinating. Um, and you know, of course. 
there would be no citizen diplomacy, at least up until the digital age, without without that that document. Um, so I, I encourage you to take take a look at that and and some of these other um, great great books that have been recently published. Um, and as always, there are these different resources where you, and organizations that you can uh, you can mine for for relevant information to your own work. Um, and I believe Paul does. Does everyone in the group get the um, yes. list of organizations and publications that that are out there on the topic? I believe so. Uh, yes, they, everybody gets the CD bulletin. Everybody gets access to this broader um, literature that we're gathering on citizen diplomacy related reports, articles, videos, books, et cetera, and so forth. There's a mounting bibliography. I think it's. I can't remember now. It's well over a thousand. Uh, I think 1,500 or so uh, publications that we're gathering slowly but surely from across the world. That's great. So yes, and and please, I think that's the to have a truly participatory group here in that sense. Uh, please do, you know, anytime you learn of anything that's relevant and and compelling, please do pass that on. So thanks again. Any any other announcements that we should be aware of? Things that are going on in citizen diplomacy. Um, if not, I just want to remind you, uh, or if you're as you're thinking, I just want to remind you of a couple things. We do have a Facebook group and a. Um, uh, we do have a, a, a LinkedIn group, which you're welcome to join. I just posted that in the Zoom chat if you haven't joined um, already. Uh, we also now have all of our meetings posted to YouTube. Uh, they are at that YouTube link. Um, and uh, we are, um, I just want to give you, lastly, the dates um, for the Citizen Diplomacy Research Group meetings coming up for the rest of the year. Um, so they're now listed in the Zoom chat. Uh, so on June 6th, we'll have a meeting uh, on city diplomacy, focused on city diplomacy, again, with two presenters. Um, on September 6th, on democratizing and localizing international relations. Um, and on December 5th, uh, either on digital diplomacy or on big data, authoritarianism, and citizen diplomacy. Uh, so you're welcome and encouraged to join those meetings. Um, and uh, otherwise, um, we're at time. So I wanted to uh, thank again, um, Sali and Vijay um, for their presentations. And uh, we will be um, communicating with you very soon to everybody with all the details, including photos, video, um, the, the agenda, the Zoom chat, et cetera, and so forth. Um, thanks for your participation, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.